my name is Dick Taylor. I'm here representing Congressman Kevin McCarthy's office, and I am interviewing Greg Underwood on Thursday, August 3rd, 2017 at Bakersfield College in Bakersfield, California. And also present with us is John, John who is uh, operating the camera, and this interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project uh, for the Library of Congress. So great. So it's, it's good uh, for us to sit down and talk again together, and uh, we've met before. Uh, starting off, where were, where were you born? Born in Bakersfield, California. Been okay. here all my life. Okay, and then you went to high school? Bakersfield High School. Nice. And um, around that time that you went in the Army, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was probably going to get drafted, so all my friends and everybody had already gone in because it was 68, it was pretty hot and heavy. And sure. So a friend of mine and I decided to join up in January 1968. And then, so that kind of leads to a second part of my question. What drove you to want to go ahead and join up? Because obviously some people waited till they were drafted. Well, you know, my grandfather was in World War One. my dad was in World War Two. It was, seemed like the thing to do, and I love my country. Right. Yeah, that's obvious. That's apparent. Um, so uh, you enlisted out of Bakersfield, and then where did you go to boot camp? I went to L.A. down there to the Athens, Los Angeles, or whatever it was, and they bust us to Fort Ord, California, for basic training. Okay, and after Fort Ord, which for those of us, uh, for those in our audience who don't know, that's up by Monterey, beautiful yeah. area. Now it's uh, it's been decommissioned. But uh, so then you had, did you have some uh, additional training after yeah, that? Yeah, we went advanced training. I went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And uh, what time of the year was that? That was in uh, March. And how was the weather down there in Fort Leonard Wood? A little chilly. Okay. We were in the big piney forest. Okay. All right. <laughs> And then, um, so so then, between the time that uh, at Fort Leonard Wood and the time that you went uh, to Vietnam, what uh, transpired? Oh, I figured when we were back there that everybody was going to Vietnam, and I just assumed that's where I was going. But we, our whole company, went to Germany. So okay. I went to Germany for a year. Okay. And at this stage, how old were you? Eighteen when I enlisted. Okay. And uh, so you went to Germany for a year, and then from Germany? Uh, I got orders for Vietnam. I came home on a two-week leave, went to Fort Lewis, Washington to do RVN training, Republic of Vietnam training. And uh, then we flew out, and I got in country in July of 69. So here you are, an 18-year-old still at the time? Well, I was right. 19 and well, almost 19. Okay, almost ready to turn 19. You, you landed in Vietnam, and did you get off the plane in the, uh, in the kind of the uh, jetways we have now, or did you go down like the stairs onto the, t onto the runway? <laughs> I can't really recall that. We did land in Cameron Bay, okay. and that's where we had spent a week at the reception station. Right, and uh, any, do you remember kind of what the, here was July, what the weather was like? Hot and humid. Right, right, and uh, lots of other guys your age kind of oh, yeah, that was, there were people all over the place yeah and then you come out and every day they'd go through names and tell you where you're going and when you say where you're going like what unit you're going to report yeah. to okay so what unit did you get assigned to uh, i was a combat engineer and I didn't really know what up to expect and uh, they sent me to the fourth infantry division so uh, for those of us that are listening that don't know what that is, what is a combat engineer's in, in a couple of sentences, what is that the main job of that? Uh, basically construct bridges, support the infantry, bunkers, uh, explosives. That's what I was, was a combat demolition specialist. And uh, so from where you landed at Cameron Bay to the area where you uh, with the 4th Infantry where you went out in the, you went out the field, in other words, you went out in the boonies away from where there were nice beds and stuff. <laughs> and so what were the sleeping accommodations like? When we left there, we flew to Pleiku, and I was up there for a week, and then we convoyed to An K, which was way up north of Pleiku, and uh, it was just a typical hooch, they called it. 
Okay. You know, tin roof and everybody had a bunk bed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so at this point, uh, did they have like a chow hall or did you guys eat sea rations or? Well, they had a mess hall at the base camp, so to speak. And so we were issued rucksacks, which is a backpack and your weapon and all that. And I was spent a week there and then I left on a chopper and went to a LZ landing zone. Okay. And then what do you remember? Um, sometimes people say that certain things they, they never forget. There were, were there maybe sounds or smells or recollections of what people were saying or what the terrain was like, uh, any of that? Basically, what really stands out in my mind is the red dirt. Okay. I mean, it's it gets in your skin and everything, you know. And the soil yeah. was all red. And, yeah. And uh, at this point, uh, were there was there rain? Yeah, at it, certain times of the year, it was monsoon season. They called it, which it constantly rained every day, right. con consistently. You know, I mean, sometimes it never stopped. Right. And uh, the other people that were in your unit, uh, you had you were. You knew them, and then they were from other parts of the country. Uh, anybody that you knew from your neck of the woods or anything like that? Oh, well, we had some, quite a few guys from Southern California, uh, San Diego. Well, of course, we all piled up. Sure, yeah. and, sure. Nice. And uh, most you guys were kind of what uh, what rank or what, uh, what? When I got over there, I was E4, Specialist 4, and uh, I made that in Germany. Before I went over there, and uh, most of those guys coming in were like PFCs, E3s. Okay, so then, so then you were a little bit higher ranked than some of those, mm -hmm. and uh, were you all guy, all you guys about the same age, or some were younger? Yeah, we were pretty close to the same age, so, maybe one year or two difference. Okay, and then when you landed at this LZ at uh, uh, on K. Um, well, that was the base camp. Yeah. So then you were there, and then you went out and from there. And then tell us about some of that stuff. Some of the, Well, some look, of the I went stuff. down to the chopper pad, and we got on a shot. First time I'd ever been on a helicopter. Loved it. And we flew out 10 or 15 miles of this LZ, LZ uh, Patricia, if I recall it. And landed, we were on top of a mountain, and the terrain was so bad you couldn't even dig in to make a foxhole. It know. was so hard? Yeah, rocky. And uh, so we scraped what we could off and pitched Poncho Hooch, you know, and that's where we stayed for 15 days, I believe we were out there. And for those that don't know, a hooch is like a little shelter? Yeah, just, yeah. A, yeah, just a stretch of Poncho, which is a plastic. We, right. You know, everybody carried those in the service. And then what? Um, what was your? Uh, what was the, the issued firearm you had? I had an M16. Okay. And you had ammunition that you kept in a pouch. Uh, we had bandoliers. Okay. Carried ten round bandoliers, so we always had two of them slung over us. And then. Um, so what were you thinking about this time? Did they prepare you for like what you might come up against, or was it just kind of like you got deer in the headlights, or everybody was kind of spooked, or kind of, yeah, uh, you you don't know what you're ex to expect, you know. It, what really stuck in my mind was when we left Cameron Bay. The guy was calling everybody's units out. He said, "Over here, I don't care if you're a cook or a." secretary or whatever you are over here everybody's a grunt yeah. i'm thinking then you know wow right <laughs> what did i get into here i right. think i'm going to be driving a, a bulldozer or a road grader or something <laughs> exactly something different so then uh so out there where you were there what were the what were the sleeping and uh, meal accommodations like sea rations for dinner lunch whatever that's pretty much what I lived on over there for 13 months. And do you, do you remember what kind of foods were in the sea rations? Because there's a lot of people maybe are going to be watching this in the future that don't know what sea rations are. I mean, I know what they are, but maybe they Well, there was know. ham slices, beans and franks, uh, scrambled eggs, which I never could handle those. <laughs> and, uh, 
Oh, uh, what else was there? Beef steak. Okay. And you'd get a little cookie, and then you'd open up the package. You'd get a little four pack of cigarettes, and chewing gum, and. That's right, because at that time you got you, they put a, a little a, a pack of cigarettes yeah, little, in there. Little various four brands. pack of Marlboros. Right, <laughs> right, and there were some matches in there. Yeah. And then, uh, did you eat that uh, cold out of the can, or did you get it heated? Or started out. Yeah, but the, the longer I was over there, because I was in demolition, we always had C4 available, so you could roll up a little ball of C4 and light it up and heat your food up, you know. And nice. We started carrying salt and pepper and garlic and livening it up a little bit, you know. Right. And did you use uh, Tabasco sauce? I never got any of that, but yeah, I, I, I like Tabasco, but I never did see it over there. Yeah, I think they later did that, but early on, if guys like you, they kind of created your own spices, <laughs> going to, like you said, garlic and salt and pepper. Yeah. Uh, and what did you drink? Uh, water, mainly. And, you know, once they used to bring out, they called a sundry pack, a great big box, and it, it had cartons of cigarettes in it, candy bars, uh, and they'd bring out beer, mm -hmm. Falstaff. Boston. Not my favorite. But, <laughs> uh, brew 102, stuff like that. But, uh, mainly, yeah, then they'd bring soda pop and stuff like that out. And did they have, were there days that you worked and days that you were off? Or were they kind of working all the time? And yeah, you're pretty much 24 7. Right. You know, we were direct support of the infantry, so when I went out, our job was to make sure everybody had an like, adequate bunker protection and uh, and then we if they found dead rounds and stuff like that I'd go take care of that and dispose of them and so what does that mean go go into that tell us about that what did you do uh, that, that? well the, the enemy had these things called satchel charges you know they they were made out of our sandbags mm. and they'd pretty much make homemade bombs you know and then He'd set them on a tripwire or whatever. Well, we found a big cache down below that when we were out at that one particular LZ, and I went down there and, and uh, disposed of it. So you used your training that the Army gave you on how to how to uh, how to render those uh, so they weren't deadly anymore. Yeah. And uh, yes, that's what's right. So they're made out of the bags, the sandbags, and without the sand in it. Pretty and, much American stuff. Wow. Wow. <laughs> And then did, uh, and at this point, had you seen anybody, I mean, had, I mean, because all of us, just like my dad in World War II and, and those in Korea, you know, you had somebody you saw that was your enemy. At this point, had you, had you or your buddies seen any people that were the enemy? I hadn't actually come face to face, but we did get attacked one night with mortars. And here we were up on top of this mountain and with no protection because we couldn't dig in. So we were assigned with a mortar unit and those guys just, they started pumping them. And, uh, and these were 60 millimeter or 81 uh, millimeter mortars? 81. Okay, okay. And, or four deuce. Four deuce, the, yeah. big, the bigger, the bigger. 4.2 inch, yeah. yes. Right. So they started popping those down the canyon down below us and, and then everything ceased. Wow. Then the next morning, we all went down there to see what was going on, but there was no enemy around. I don't, evidently, they got the message and got out. Mm -hmm. That's where we found that big cache of... Uh, so they were getting ready to make, they had made other yeah, they, satchel charges getting ready. They obviously knew we were up there, but it was kind of nice because we were on top of a mountain, so there wasn't nobody coming from up above us. Sure. And uh, what was the vegetation like? There, it was kind of... I'd call it maybe high chaparral-ish, maybe so bushy, good. but not real, not a lot of trees. Okay, and um, so it kind of rain every day, rain not every other, maybe every other day or something. Uh, like that. Back then, in, in the summertime, it wasn't too bad because the monsoon hadn't hit yet. Okay. And then later into the, into the winter months, and that'll start up. And you mentioned earlier about making one of your duties was to make sure that everybody had a kind of a bunker. So how, how did you do that? Well, we had a, an SOP manual, Standard Operating Procedures, and we went to one LZ. We were out there for 33 days and pretty well dug in. Well, our job was to go around and make sure all the infantry guys cut the appropriate size logs, 
and you gotta layer it one way, run it the other way, then you put three layers of sandbags on top of it, which would stop an 81 mortar wow. if it was a direct hit. So uh, do you did you have uh, buddies that you uh, formed up with that you kind of took a liking to, that you guys became pals, that you maybe remember their names or? Oh yeah, uh, Mike Conful, uh, Wayne Langston, there was, uh, it, Mike was a little guy from New Jersey, and he was he was demolition too. Him and I usually worked together when we were, you know, if chopper pilots had come in, they need a tree out of the way so they could land better. You know, we'd do stuff, go blow a tree up, or was that how you would get rid of a tree and blow yeah, it up? Oh, that or chainsaws if it was small enough. But, and was was there any heavy equipment, or was this all this stuff kind of like chainsaws and hand tools? And, our stuff, yeah, but we had a in the engineer outfit. They always flew a crane out with a mini dozer, and we had a dozer operator would dig the holes for the tactical operations center. Well, he, they always dug ours for us, but right. the infantry guys, uh -uh. right? They had to dig. It <laughs> they had to dig their own. Did they use an entrenching tool, an e tool? Yeah. yeah. And for those that don't know, an e tool is a, like a foldable shovel. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it fares better uh, than others, so depending upon the train. Sometimes it comes out all bent up because the train's so hard and with rocks. So, so what do you remember? Um, do, do you remember getting anything? I mean, how did you guys find out about news from home, or was there any news from home? Uh, yeah, you get the Army Times. You know, we'd go in periodically. They call it a stand down. We'd go back to On K for a week. You know, get the clean up. And, eat a hot meal and, and then we'd get the army times and uh, i think there was another one we used to get over there i can't recall what the name of it was but keep you up to date and you could you know you always heard the gossip floating around you know sure. rumor control yeah. so a lot of us uh, assume that you know everybody gets to take a, a hot shower every day so when you're out in the field out doing these bunkers uh, maybe not so much huh no, nah, that one time we were out 33 days, all we had, we had water to brush our teeth and drink. So a lot of people have been camping, they can kind of relate to that. Sometimes <laughs> it's hard, kind of hard to think about not being able to take a full-blown shower until you get back after 30 some odd yeah, days. You get a little ripe. Yeah, I imagine. Uh, but that was monsoon at that particular time, so, you know, we'd stand out there with a bar of soap and just... Right. Wash off. Wow. And, and the, so at this point, and, and uh, there were no uh, females in these units. No. It was all males. And then, um, so how did you maintain, or was there such a thing as maintaining your uniform? I mean, what did you do with, as far as cleaning them? No, uh, they'd, they'd bring us out clean ones, you know. They'd just throw a pile of them, you grab out a pair, it looks like they'd fit, you know. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily stuff it, that was yours? It no. Was just, well, you started out with that, but, you know. Wow. And then, uh, so those that you wore, when you went back uh, to base camp and got to take a shower and eat a hot meal, did you take your uniform back and they would wash them or, or did you, yeah. were you responsible for doing that or somebody else was? We had our stuff there. At, at that time I was an E5, so I had my own little room with another E5. We had bunks in there and then we had a hooch maid, we called her, and she took care of all our laundry and cleaned everything for us. So when and, we got back in there, we always had everything fresh, clean, and everything. And, and was this a, a Vietnamese a civilian? Yeah. Okay. And did they speak English? Yeah. And, but they spoke Vietnamese as well? And uh, so did you get, did you write home, or did you get letters from home? Yeah, we, we wrote. And uh, once in a while, I'd, if I was in there for a week or so, I'd get QC because of my rank charge of quarters. Okay. Uh, I called home once from there. It was kind of strange because you had to go over after you said your speak and I had to try to explain to my parents, you know, after you say something you got to say over. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. What was the mail service like? Uh, it, you'd go, for, you know, two or three weeks maybe sometimes a month before you'd get it, and they'd finally get the mail out there where we were at, you know, you'd get, that was a big deal, mail call, kind of like the airplane, right? Right, right, <laughs> and so, and then, uh, and some people don't know this, how, uh, uh, when you wrote a letter home, let's say you wrote a letter, was it like to your mom or dad or somebody, 
So would you put a stamp on it, or how did that work? I just, I think we just filled it out and sent it because they stamped a PO on it. Yeah. Army Post Office. Right. Sent it off. Right, and then um, so. Uh, at this point, uh, did you ever hear from anybody, like some of your people that you went to uh, VHS with? I mean, had anybody that you went to school with ever write you, or did they? Did any of them know that you were over there? Uh, the, the majority of the, 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 our little group that hung around back in the high school days, they were all in the military too. Uh, then Pete, the buddy of mine, that him and I went in together. He spent his whole three years in Germany. So I never heard from him for three years. My brother, which were twins, he's 10 minutes older than I am, went to Okinawa and I got one letter from him in three years. And I, I, didn't, I hadn't seen him in three years when we got out of the service. Wow. And then what branch was your brother in? Army. Okay. And then, um, so, you know, you saw some of these things, you, you, had, you, had, you mentioned this one mortar attack. And is there any precursor to that? I mean, you're you're just standing there or sleeping, and all of a sudden stuff started blowing up. Or yeah, we it was at probably around midnight. We were all crapped out in the in the, the hooch, so to speak. And I heard them. Well, we know I take that back. We were sitting there because it was even dark, and we had some new guys with us. I'd been over there for six, seven months already. You know, I'd, I told them to be quiet because I heard the mortar tube. I said, that's the mortar, and about that time they came in. So you, you know. could hear it off in the distance yeah. as, it was, as it launched. That's, it's got a distinctive sure. sound. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sometimes uh, uh, people that are in the service like you, uh, uh, they refer to that as the whispering death because it makes kind of a whistling sound yeah. as, it, as it comes in. And um, so did these younger guys kind of look to you because you've been over there six months, which a lot of times people would think, well, but that kind of makes you a little saltier, a little bit more knowledgeable on what to look out for. So do they kind of look to you guys that have been around a little bit longer as to what to do? And yeah. It's, it, I told them, I said, get your hard hat and your flak jacket and get under that cover. Right. And the next five, they walked in, were a little bit closer. And I'm looking at Wayne Langston, that buddy of mine. I said, man, this ain't gonna how it's going to end, I hope. Right. <laughs> so that's when the, the four East guys started doing their thing. And, and the, the Americans? On yeah, our, side. All, our guys. And, and then um, was that loud? I mean, it was a, and did you have hearing protection? No, I was going to bring that up because I get a disability from the government because, sure. yeah, back in those days, they didn't know it here. They didn't think about hearing protection. So. Probably got ringing in the ears right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so um, was that uh, so? So there was the mortar fire. Was there other other types of enemy fi enemy other ways that the enemy because you had satchel charges, and they would use trip wires. That would be for like the, for the infantry that you were assigned to, or that you were supporting. Uh, were there other types of ways that the enemy would try to get you guys? Yeah, we used to, at this one place. We were out for thirty three days. LZ, uh, Susie. So there was Patricia, and then there was another one. Oh, named I get there's a list of them that long right. I've been to. You know. Were they all ladies' names? Most of them. Okay. Is there a reason for that? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and then the fire bases were had different names because the fire base was different because it was our all all artillery. You know. Right. But I know, I remember every morning at, when we were there at ten o'clock, you could set your clock by it. This this guy'd come out of a hole down in canyon to snipe at us. You know. He, mm -hmm. So he'd shoot at you with some sort of rifle? Probably an AK-47. That's got a distinctive sound as well. Sure. And, and we just knew it. 10 o'clock, this guy's going to come out and shoot at us. And, and, and was it one of those things where you would hear the rounds hit someplace? Or? Oh, they'd go over your head. So I was down one morning, we were setting some charges to blow some trees, and I, he started shooting, and I dropped everything, and I, and I beat feet to the bunker. Wow. I could hear him going over my head. I was getting a little too close. Wow. And um, so uh, relating to that, relating to the, the mortars and that, so at this point, had you, so you, you had a, uh, the lady that helped, the, the, that was a Vietnamese civilian, so were there other like either Viet Cong or North, uh, North Vietnamese Army people that you did see? Did you ever see them, or you just kind of they were off in the distance from a? Uh, we went when we went into Cambodia. I saw some there. 
And of course, at that time, the United States was saying, "Hey, we didn't go. We were, we're not going into Cambodia." But, yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, we went. Yep. And I had no. there, was a, there was a fellow that I I knew from our school that was killed in Cambodia, and of course, it was they never acknowledged that that's where he actually was killed. That was a little bit scary there because we we convoyed from on K all the way down south to Plaisirang, and and we were sitting there listening to the radios when the first sortie flew in there. They shot two choppers down, killed the captain and several other GIs, and then we were on the next load going in, and mm -hmm. I wasn't liking that. Yeah. So we got in there and we we, went, we landed where there was an arc light, a B fifty two strike whenever they did it and it just it just clears everything and a lot of people don't know that that's what it's called it's called an arc light and that's where yeah. the b-52s come in and drop the big 250 or 500 pounds. thousand pounders or yeah you could hear them at night or you could feel them and then you'd see the light the flash that's sure. what they called it the arc light so the arc light um were there other aircraft that you would hear fly overhead and you had helicopters yeah too. we flew in on a chinook the two-bladed and uh he wouldn't land. We had to bail out. So you would then, hover over the ground. You guys stepped off, jumped off the back of the ramp. It was a little higher than jumping on. I mean, we were probably 15 feet up, and everybody in the tree line telling us, "Get over here," because you were going to get. Yeah, was we, this place we landed was right on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And the Ho Chi Minh Trail, for those that don't know this, what, what's the significance of the Ho Chi Minh Trail? That came down through Laos and Cambodia from North Vietnam. That's where they brought all their supplies in at. And then they had little veins where they'd come into to Vietnam with, with all their stuff. Right. And uh, that, that was their supply route. And so, so you were in there, and uh, so you mentioned a captain was killed. Was that a captain in your unit? Uh, he was in the 4th Infantry. I don't remember recall which unit he was with. And uh, he was. you said he was in an aircraft that got shot down in a helicopter? Uh, yeah. Was yeah. it in a Chinook? Uh, yeah, a Huey. In a Huey, a smaller yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. Um, and would, uh, did you ever have uh, medevacs or dust-off uh, helicopters, Hueys, come in? Oh, yeah. And, and those were the guys that you worked with, or guys in the infantry units that got wounded and they hauled them away? Mm -hmm. And so what were your thoughts about that when, when you saw something like that happen? Uh, just wish them well, you know. And were they visibly injured? Were they bleeding? And I didn't see a whole lot of that. I, I did see a few that were wounded, but not severely. Right. And they got them out of there. And then we were there, we spent a week in there. And uh, there was, they killed quite a few of them, and they had them all laid out there. You know, it was pretty graphic, yeah. and uh, I just kind of walked away from that. And then they called in a airstrike, and uh, I still see that because they came in and dropped napalm. Well, I mean, what a sight! Right. And for people that don't know what napalm is, it's like a gel, and when it explodes it splatters this gel stuff and it's on fire and you can't get it out you, if you try to brush it it just spreads it and it's, it's pretty gruesome yeah to say the least yeah. so uh so now you're past your six months uh, now you're kind of and how long did you end up spend, spending in, in country I was there. I extended 22 days so I didn't have to come back to to the America and do six months Okay, so you extended 20, that was an option, they said, hey, if yeah. you want, um, you could extend 22 days and then go. And then, then, I, then I got out. I, when I out. left Vietnam, I flew in, a buddy of mine worked in battalion command, and he got me orders for Oakland Army Base nice. instead of going to Fort Lewis. So nice. we flew into Travis, and everybody got out and kissed the ground, and we took cabs to over to Oakland Army Base. And it's like 24 hours processing to get out. And then the plane you flew into Travis, was it like a military yeah, or civilian? Yeah, it was commercial. Okay. I think it was TWA at the time. So there were flight attendants on that? And, uh, yeah. That was probably some of the first uh, civilian yeah. people you'd seen since you were over there. And yeah. I still remember the captain. We were supposed to land in Hawaii because we left Vietnam and stopped. I left out of Benoit and we flew to Okinawa and fueled up. And we were supposed to stop in Hawaii. 
and he got on the on the intercom he said i got a hellacious tailwind we're going on into travis and everybody just yahoo <laughs> wow and uh and then you were in uniform at this point when you landed you're all wearing uniforms did they give you a a clean uniform to wear on the plane, or did you have to wear something that was all muddy and everything? No, we had some good, still had some good uniforms we had at the barracks. You know. And did they feed you on the plane? I don't even remember that, Dick. <laughs> you were so yeah. happy to get yeah. out of there. And so there were people, uh, so like over some of the last things you remember as you were as you were leaving uh, Vietnam, getting on the plane? Uh, I think one thing that sticks in my mind, we were, we were having a screwing around having a water fight in the barracks and we were using these old pump fire extinguishers and a buddy of mine was holding the hose and I was pumping it and the, the I foot slipped off the peg on it and it came up and the lid came off of it came down right over my big toe smashed it and I was in agony and the, the night before we were supposed to leave I woke the medic up, I think, at 1 o'clock in the morning. I said, you got to do something about this, you know. So he took a little ream and got the pressure off of it. You yeah. know, I had a toe that big around. And <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I flew down, which was kind of ironic. We flew down to Benoit, and we're all standing in line waiting to get our orders and everything. And uh, the guy in front of me turned around and was Joe Contreras, who I went all through school with. I mean... Wow, right. he was down in the Delta at the Ninth Infantry, and he was on his way home. So that was somebody that you knew that you bumped yeah. into, kind of as you're getting I mean, ready to thirteen thousand miles away from home, run into somebody you went to school with, you know. Yeah, goes into the small world category. Oh yeah. So that action you described, uh, uh, where people got medevaced and some of the enemy had been uh, the enemy casualties laid out there, and then they came in and did napalm and, and stuff like that. So. Was there other action that, that you witnessed or were involved in? Uh, yeah, I got called upon because we used to do that periodic. They called it a hump, which you went out with a, a company of infantry. And that's what I went out for a week, and I wasn't liking that. But I did it. That was my deed, my job, you know. And I, so we went out on a search and destroy out in the moon we were in triple canopy jungle you know you couldn't see the sun it was <laughs> nighttime it was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face mm -hmm. and uh we got a little sniper action there and then one night we were sitting we had a little had dug out a little bit kind of a makeshift foxhole and we saw all these lights coming down the side of a mountain we we're going what is that I mean, like it was a whole company or somebody, you know. So they ended up calling an airstrike in on that, and everything just went away. I don't know if they were holding torches or what the deal was, wow. but, you know. And then the next morning, we said we're going down in there, and I'm not, I'm not liking that. But we went down in there, and we had a little activity down there, hmm. kind of a semi firefight, so to speak. Uh, we did we're running out of water we had to get some water out of an old dirty pond you know and put the pills in it and it was, in your canteen yeah and these were the plastic yeah the all plastic, drab. plastic all the drab canteens mm -hmm. and uh anyway i can remember the radio crackling and coming on it was my sergeant said i need underwood back here asap so they flew a chopper out and I got out of there. <laughs> then I went from there to another LZ. Wow. And then, uh, and then, would you were you guys shooting your M16s uh, at certain points? Uh, I've only fired at one time over there, and it was called a Mad Minute because hmm. we were getting sniper fire at that one particular LZ I was telling you about. So at midnight, the whole perimeter opened up. Wow. So I ran a few clips here on automatic, but it was kind of funny because we shot red tracers. So was, you know, everybody, you know, every seventh round had a red tracer in it. So after that all ceased, then here comes some barrage back with green tracers, and green which was, was the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody got hurt, 
and I think it was probably just all in a big game, so to speak. They were probably out there laughing about it, you know. So, uh, so now we're past. Uh, now we're going to uh, the point where you, you, you loaded on the plane, got kind of a clean uniform, and I guess clean underwear, and, <laughs> and uh, you, you come back and they, you land at Travis. So, what, what was your recollection of how you were received, uh, whether you know by your family or, or the civilians in the area? Well, I, I got on a plane. We, I flew back to Bakersfield out of San Francisco, and. Uh, my dad picked me up at the airport because there was back then there wasn't nobody out there at Meadows Field and we drove to the house. Well, I grew up behind a gas station on Union Avenue and Jack, the guy that, you know, he knew I was in the service so we pulled in there and I said hi to him and everything and I just, we went to the house and, you know, grabbed my mom, gave her a big hug and the rest is history. Wow. <laughs> So this is a, a, a service station on Union that the guy named Jack. That yeah. Kind of, wasn't a Hancock station, was it? Union 76. Union. Uh, and at that time, Union was the highway. That was Highway 99. Yeah. yeah. So then, um, so have you um, maintained any any connections with any of your, any of your veterans over the years? No, outside of Pete, Elliot, my brother. Uh, Gordon Young, a real good friend of ours, just passed away here recently, had uh, melanoma, and uh, that was kind of a shocker. And, uh, but I've met other veterans throughout the years, you know, we reminisce. And, uh, that since I've gone on this honor flight, it's been uh, way better, yeah. you know. So what, what uh so, if you, if you were summarizing for somebody that's listening to this that didn't know you and had never met you, so what, um, what, how did your wartime experiences affect your life and then um, maybe life lessons you learned from your military service? Well, I've often thought of that. Uh, I got a good friend of mine, that, you know, he gets, he had post traumatic and uh, some other stuff, and, but he was on a medevac, so he, saw a little, probably some pretty bad stuff and uh, I, did, I saw my share but I, I don't really think I had any kind of post-traumatic stress it never affected me I, you know I could sleep at night and, and uh, as far as my experience goes I, I'm sure glad I went in yeah, I had a good time in there to be quite honest with you made a lot of friends and I don't I kind of think about that off and on. I'll get on the computer once in a while on the 4th Infantry website, scroll through there, see if I can find anybody I served with. And uh, did find one gentleman, and I sent him an email I never heard back from him. <laughs> and you live in a community here in Kern County, Bakersfield in particular, that, uh, where we uh, honor our veterans. And uh, I'm sure now you, you see that, and it's... And even though you may not recognize it, you're an inspiration to to those that are going into service now, and uh, you know those that uh, that as a result of your your service uh, get to enjoy the way of life we have. And you know, it wasn't your choice. You, know, you can. I think now it's different. People realize you can you can disagree with the policy of the government, but you still honor the warrior, the person like you that ended up going in. And you were 18, 19 years old, and yeah. you were just following following orders. Not unlike what's what they're going through right now, you sure. know. And it, I just I don't understand that war over there. I don't really want to, you know. Yeah. And I just feel sorry for the poor guys coming home. Sure. You know. Yeah. And I went to a, a fundraiser for one vet that lost both his legs, and it, it, he's miraculous. I mean, he's got prosthesis. He stood up, and, and he's still trying to get accustomed to walking on those but uh, he told uh, he told everybody the whole story uh, you know, when he was in Afghanistan how everything happens you know and I, yeah. I mean what an, an honor to meet him yeah and I'll guarantee even though you won't admit it uh, uh, you're, you're an inspiration to all the guys like that and guys like us people like us too because I mean just the service that all these experiences you've had and the the exposure to what you were exposed to and uh, and how you conducted yourself and your character uh, says a lot and, and, and 
it's guys like you that are what's right with this country. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, Dick. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, and you know, this whole thing, someday people are going to look back at this when we're all long gone and, and uh, they're going to enjoy listening to hear about your stories and, and your uh, your honorable military service and the, and the honor that you brought to our community. Yeah. When I got the call from, from uh, Sherry, yeah, I thought about it for a minute and I said, well, yeah, this might be the thing to do, you know. Yeah. And I told her, yeah, sign me up. Right. And Monica called me. Right, and, uh, right. Well, this is good. I mean, and this your story uh, uh, is one of those things that we want to hear, and that's you're just the kind of guy that, uh, that we want to hear about. And Do you have anything else to add before we wrap it up? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, uh, I'm glad I went over there, did my time, and came home. Right. You guys, you guys got anything else to add before we shut her down? Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much, Greg. Thank you for your service, and thank you for agreeing to speak for us today. And again, thanks for the inspiration you provide to the rest of us and the freedom you provided. Well, you're very welcome. Dick. All right.